Hello and welcome to the Sharpening Report. I am your host, Josh Peck. I want to jump in today's episode because we have a really exciting and interesting topic, something I know almost nothing about. So this is uh, definitely going to be interesting. I welcome on my good friend, Jared Crestman to the show. First time on Sharpening Report. Jared, how are you doing? Man, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me, Josh. Absolutely. Thanks for making time to be on the show. So for those of, uh, the, for the viewers who have no idea who you are, not familiar with your work, um, you're, you're actually pretty active. You do a lot of stuff. Can you give people an uh, introduction to yourself where people can find you online and uh, like what kind of work you, you, you do? Yeah, if, uh, if anybody would know me, it would be through our YouTube channel, Through the Black, where I've been uh, doing videos with my friend Tom Dunn for years now, I guess a little over three years, right at three years, maybe more, um, kind of lost track. Um, we uh, did some documentaries early on. One was detestable. This is a war. Tom's gone on to do fire and brimstone, which was a look at the, uh, you know, the LGBTQ movement with, you know, the transgender stuff that's happening today. So uh, we've been all over the place, everything from spiritual warfare to satanic ritual abuse to transgender politics. I mean, we've just been everywhere. And, um, so I don't know. We've ended up on all weird corners of the internet that are available. So <laughs> awesome. And then, yeah, we still have some of your uh, uh, arch archived episodes at dailyrenegade.com. So if people are viewing this on daily renegade, you can uh, go into the show. It's uh, through the black uncensored and you can find some amazing episodes there. So yeah, I've been, uh, I've been enjoying you and Tom's work for a long time. I know some of, some of that stuff is on prime now, isn't it? Yes, uh, Detestable and This is a War was just recently released on Amazon. So as long as, until they figure it out, it's going to be there. We, we still kind of eagerly anticipate this, uh, this massive fascist system of media to kick us out soon enough. But for right now, it is the, both of those are available for those that have Amazon Prime. So. Fantastic. Yeah, people should go check that out. And uh, yeah, I'm waiting for the same thing. So I just put Silent Cry on um, Amazon, which th those who follow me are probably probably have been hearing enough of that. But basically, it's a documentary about child sex trafficking and the occultism around it. And we were actually able to get that on Amazon. And I was uh, kind of surprised. Uh, so until they figure it out what, what we've done, uh, they have they've left it up there. So that's good. So yeah, I, I, I highly encourage the audience to go check out those films on Amazon. So this is a topic that um, I know almost nothing about except the little bit that you hear in public school. And I'm assuming most of that is probably wrong, just like everything else, you know, that you hear in American history in public schools, a lot of it's messed up. Uh, the Puritans. And I mean, this is like, at the time of uh, right at the founding of our country, uh, we we have uh, you know a lot of history here for the Christian church in America. And it, it's interesting to think about how Christianity in America, you know, what it is today, how that, how that was birthed from where it began. And I know this is something that you have looked into. So to get us started here, for, for those who, I, I can't imagine there's anybody out there who's never heard of the Puritans, but I imagine probably a lot of people don't really, uh, they're probably like me, they probably have heard the word, but don't really know much about them. What's some of the history here? Who, who were the Puritans? The, the, well, first of all, let's just make, let's just address the elephant in the room, which is usually when the word Puritan is used in English vernacular, it's very negative, right? right. So <laughs> I would say my interest in the Puritans goes way beyond the normal caricature of modern day and to the heart of who the Puritans were. Puritan, when you say the word Puritan, it tends to evoke this sense of staunchy, uh, strict, super conservative, never smile, well, there's no joy, it's just legalistic religion and it's finest, no one wants to be a Puritan, right? Puritan <laughs> is bad. And, you know, to be honest with you, the devil's done a great job um, at turning that word into a cuss word, because right. there's never been a group of people that have done more for Christianity um, you know, outside of the formation of the, the early church, the apostles and the disciples and you know, all those that came, you know, after, you know, with the growth of the early church. It was a time period where um, dedication to scriptural purity was at its highest. You know, every, most of the freedoms that we enjoy, the, the church being built in the United States, the institutions, the focus on education, largely a result of the Puritans 
who came out of the Reformation. Um, the, the, ref, the Reformers and the Puritans are usually separated. You know, the Reformers went to war trying to bring Christianity back to its early roots, not trying to create something new, but coming against the, 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 the Catholic Church, in essence, that had essentially started burning people for printing Bibles, you know, in yeah. languages that anybody could read. There was, it, was, it was an uphill battle. It was a war that took place. And once the, once the Protestant church had been established, there was this several hundred year period of time where religion, and I, I hate saying that word because now we're like, it's, you know, relationship, not religion, you know, that, but religion flourished. And not just some sort of weird legalistic obsession with the ideas of Christianity, but an obsession with how to apply every aspect of the Bible to our lives. So whereas we went from debating over core doctrines, you know, these, these core doctrines, we moved in this beautiful period of time where how do these doctrines affect our work lives? How do these doctrines affect our marriages? What is piety? What is it, what is it like to walk uh, in holiness, what should the Christian life look like? And, you know, one of the things that's so unique to the Puritans was their, th really the Puritans developed something I refer to as a theology of suffering. It was a period of time that was not just full of blessings. It was a period of time that was mostly full of sorrows. But in the midst of those sorrows, the Puritans had a joy that no man was able to take, no matter how many blessings were stripped from their lives. Um, you know, on average, the, the average number of children the Puritans had somewhere around nine, I think nine to ten children, and f usually four to five of those children died. If you do the averages on the number of Puritans, how many kids they had, how many they lost, Puritans on average lost half of their children. And yet in their writings, you would never be able to tell the immense amount of suffering that they were going through because they just bled scripture. They bled faith. They trusted the Lord and they delighted in him, even if they were suffering from incredible trials and tribulations. They had an, they had an understanding of God's providence that most of us have lost to this day. They understood that God had not lost track of a single atom, but all events had been organized and were in control by a sovereign God. They knew that even when they they, they, they suffered such horrible, you know, um, tragedies in their own lives that it would be for the glory of God. And when you look back and you read these writings that came out of such intense times of personal suffering, yet God is glorified and exalted and Christ is, is the center of their entire worldview, you can't help but fall in love with who God made these people. It, it, it honestly is probably the most incredible body of, uh, of literature outside of, of scripture that I've ever encountered. And I, over the last three or four years, although I am no Puritan expert, um, I have grown, I have fallen in love with Puritan literature. And I've, I don't think I've bought something from a bookstore outside of science fiction in a long time because I've just been build, I've been building a Puritan library. So that's amazing. Yeah. And it's, it's so cool to think about our roots and where we come from and also looking back and, and comparing it today and how much we've lost, you know, how much, how much of that original uh, kind of attitude we lost. So, so for a time period, uh, what, what kind of time period are we looking at uh, from, from the, the, the time that this Puritan kind of movement started to where it ended and then how, how did it start and how did it end and what was that time period? So not, you know, everything that I'm bringing to the table is an, an amateur non-historian's perspective who's just fallen in love with books, right? So my dating is definitely going to be off and I'm probably going to say some stupid stuff, but I'm going to give <laughs> generalities, right? It's yeah, really yeah. easy to do the Google searches. So the Reformation really happened mainly in the early 1500s, right? And there was a period of time where people thought the Reformation had failed. It took a while to really take root where people realized that, no, what happened in the time of Luther and Calvin, it stuck. Knox, Luther, Luther Calvin, that it stuck, and it had become something that the Lord blessed immensely. It was obviously a byproduct of, of, of God working in the life of church history. It was in the early 1600s or whenever, whenever William Perkins was born. William Perkins is largely considered to be the first Puritan. The Puri 
like I said, you really had a war that took place that then was followed by a time of spiritual growth. William Perkins was a byproduct of the Reformation and really considered to be the first Puritan. Um, after that, we had literally a couple hundred years, you know, the, the, the late 1500s, early, mostly 16, late 1500s, 1600s, on into the 1700s. Jonathan Edwards, I, and this is debatable, this is just people's perceptions, there's not really a concrete definition of when Puritanism started, when it ended. Um, Jonathan Edwards is considered to be the blossom of what all Puritanism led to. He was sort of the finest example, in my opinion, of what Puritanism was leading towards. He gave us books like Religious Affections and Freedom of the Will, still even in the secular culture, considered to be the finest mind that America has ever produced. Even in your secular philosophical and uh, liberal theological circles, as much as they hate him, um, because he was very, he was very Calvinistic. He was, you know, a, um, very uh, into the sovereignty of God. These are things that kind of work negatively with more liberal ideas. Um, he was largely considered to be the finest mind, regardless of if they if they trusted in his his own beliefs and his perceptions of interpretations of Scripture. He is considered to be the finest mind. So he would be the blossom of Puritanism. Later on, really the, the, the love of Puritanism and Puritan uh, literature as it was affecting ministers on a large scale, that about ended with the death of Charles Spurgeon. Everything that we love about Charles Spurgeon was, Spurgeon never went to seminary. Spurgeon created a school, but Spur what most people don't realize is Spurgeon was one of the most well-read individuals that has ever graced a pulpit in Britain. Spurgeon grew up with his grandfather's Puritan library. Spurgeon had an entire Puritan library under his belt and read by the time he assumed the pulpit. And um, the Puritans literally, I mean, God used the Puritans to build who Charles Spurgeon is. And so when you really start to see the influence that the Puritans had on Christian history over hundreds of years, um, it becomes, you know, all of a sudden those time periods become more fascinating. Interrupt me whenever you want. Um, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just listening. I mean, this is, this is really interesting stuff. So what ended up happening was towards the 1820s, eschatology started to change with Edward Irving and J.N. Darby, right? We started moving from mostly amillennial, postmillennial forms of end times worldview to the premillennial worldview as we started moving in the dispensationalist movement. Uh, but what's interesting, and I'm not, I used to be a premillennial. I think it's no secret now with some of the stuff I've been doing with Brian Gadawa that I, I am a postmillennial because of the Puritans. Uh -huh. Because of my, my time with the Puritans, I see, I see the eschatology that drove them. In fact, Ian Murray wrote a book called The Puritan Hope, which just talks about Puritation, uh, Puritan interpretation of Scripture in regard to prophecy. And um, in the 1820s, alongside with liberalism, as it began to advance, eschatology, eschatology changed with the more liberal thought process in the church. Um, Puritanism and the love of the Puritans and sort of our respect for them started to decline all around the same time. And it wasn't until the 1950s with Martin Lloyd-Jones, um, I can't remember the name of Jones Church, but if you could see, uh, I'm a big fan of Jones. All these color, all these colorful books, if I can find <laughs> it, all these colorful books right here. I can't quite do it, but those colorful books right here. That is all one commentary on Romans that Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote. Martin Lloyd-Jones had one of the most influential ministries in London, uh, coming out, you know, before the World War, coming out of World War II. Um, he spent 14 years expositing on the Book of Romans, and he loved the Puritans. In fact, one of his associate pastors went on to create a publishing company called uh, Banner of Truth, which just specialized in bringing back and reprinting Puritan literature. And around that time in the 50s, more publishing companies opened up, and they began to seek out and print Puritan literature. And one of the most beautiful things, Josh, about living in 2020, regardless of all the nonsense, is we're living in a day now where Puritan literature has been created and then the interest declined and it resurged and it's declined. But through advancements in technology, Puritan literature is back on the scene. 
and it is cheaper than it has ever been to purchase because of modern technology. Um, the, it, the, the amount of resources that are available to us now from the Puritans in regards to, like even in the 1970s, it's unparalleled. It's, 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 Jonathan Edwards died with like 300 books in his library. I have done almost nothing compared to Jonathan Edwards and I've got thousands, you know? Um, but I just love the fact that we live in a day when it is so readily available. Um, you know, you can buy these Puritan paperbacks on virtually any topic. You know, they've got entire resources, um, for anybody that's ever interested in studying Puritan literature, now for the first time we've got things like a guide to the Puritans where you can look up like you would in a systematic theology textbook. You can look up, uh, say, what did the Puritans write about widows and widowers? And you'll have a list of Puritan writings or books that were produced where there was something to a widow or widower, widower that was produced. Now pastors and researchers are using books like this to go seek out things in Puritan literature they wouldn't run into naturally. Um, that was written by Robert Martin. That's a great resource for anybody that wants to do research in certain subjects with the Puritans rather than just reading, you know, random books that they choose. Joel Beek, who is more of a Puritan scholar than anybody else on the scene right now, Joel Beek is an amazing man. Um, he spent his life reading the Puritans, much like Spurgeon. I gather from his own personal testimony, he grew up with a Puritan library. It dramatically affected the course of his life. Um, he and another man actually came out, Randall uh, uh, Peterson, they actually came out with a book called Meet the Puritans, which is a, it's a thick book. But what you're able to do is go through and look at the basic biography of almost all the Puritans on record and get a complete list of the works that are available now. So you kind of get an idea for what some of the Puritans specialized in, what they wrote, and it allows people now to make more educated decisions on where to start when reading them. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, and I definitely want to get into the eschatology and, and prophetic stuff because that's something that I, I think most people, myself included, know nothing about. Like where, you know, especially in the beginning of our country, in the American church, like where uh, where it began in terms of eschatology and, and how, you know, how it became the way it is today because there's a lot of different views today. Uh, before we get there, though, uh, we, we, might, we might do that for the, the, the members only section, but before we get there what what were like some of the core doctrines of puritanism and what what set them apart uh from other christians of the time and how would we compare and contrast it to uh like christianity today and some of the you know doctrines and beliefs that we have today so what, what were their like core doctrines well they were they were they were traditional reformed calvinists number 1 which is a cuss word in a lot of circles today <laughs> mainly because of hyper calvinism having run rampant so not not everything called reform today would align with the reformed principles of the puritans in fact um, when you start to use some some of the same words you know it's just like anything that happens in language over uh, several hundred years people have developed caricatures of what certain things are without actually understanding the variances and nuances and how things have split like for not every presbyterian church is the same right you have yeah. liberal presbyterian churches now that have split from conservative presbyterian churches that might as well just be the most liberal end of the methodist church um, you can't just say, anytime someone, anytime I'm talking about theology of the Puritans, Cal, the word Calvinism has to come up. It has to come up for good or for bad, whether someone starts throwing <laughs> something at you or yelling at you or whatever, it, ha it has to come up. Um, and, and I always have to ask, are you a Calvinist? And I'll have to ask, what, what is your definition of a Calvinist? And most of the time I say, no, right. no, I'm not. <laughs> uh, but I'm not defending traditional Calvinism. I am a traditional Reformed Calvinist in line with the Puritans. So they believed in the sovereignty of God over all things. They have believed that God was sovereignly in control of changing a person's will and desire to follow him. Um, so that they, they really hammered home, um, you know, larger doctrines of predestination. The, the ultimate difference, though, between a lot of your modern hyper-Calvinists today and like a traditional Calvinist of the Puritan, was Puritans had a much better understanding of the concept of the human will. Mm -hmm. they, this kind of culminated with Jonathan Edwards. They understood that a person can only choose something 
if they desired to choose it. And they understood that sin had affected the human heart to its basis level affecting its desire. They understood that man can't choose what he likes. He likes what he likes and he chooses accordingly. And only when God comes in and changes a person's heart is there any desire for Christ that can then be freely chosen. That a person's desires must fundamentally be changed. The heart must be regenerated before a person can freely choose God. There was no, there was no issue between free will and, uh, you know, like a, a free agency. You know, most people today say, well, if you don't have free will, God just makes you do these things. They understood that man loathed God until he gave them the gift of a regenerated heart. And when that heart had been ge- regenerated, breathing life into those dead bones, that when genuine desire for the Lord came from a renewed heart, they were able to act as free agents. There was no coercion, but man's intrinsic nature had to be changed from where it was left decimated by the fall, okay? And, and so that was their understanding. They, it actually, traditional Reformed Calvinism built modern missions, it was the catalyst for the major revivals that we have in the history of the world. The best revivals we ever had came out of people understanding that only God could regenerate a person's heart, that it didn't fall underneath our ability to articulate doctrine any better than the other or explain something better than somebody else could, but only by prayer and supplication would we be used as a means of God's own work in bringing people to know him. And it started to lead towards the creation of, 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 of worldwide mission outreaches. Um, their eschatology, their understanding of eschatology was that the gospel would go forth to the whole world, that like Romans 11, the fullness of the Gentiles would enter in, and that they would be pleased to be a part of the work that God was doing in the life of all of those by taking the gospel. That it was not their ability to present the gospel but an unadulterated, pure gospel taken to the world, no matter how offensive it was, that it was like planting seeds that God would water long after their death. They thought about the church long-term, not short-term. As, as eschatology has changed over the years, so has our idea of what missions looks like. And we went from planting institutions in heathen lands, thinking about the gospel flourishing sort of like a, an orchard, um, and started focusing more and more on one-on-one personal salvations, individual salvations. The altar call started being developed one-on-one. Let's just go get people saved because this world's only going to get more evil until Christ comes back. That wasn't the Puritan understanding. The Puritan understanding from Scripture was that the gospel, as according to Matthew and Jesus' own words, was like a mustard seed. And that it would blossom into this tree eventually with these overarching branches that would envelop and cover, but it would take a long time to get there. And so what they wanted to do, knowing that this was God's work, not their own, was just take the gospel to the world and let God do with the, with the gospel what only God can do with the gospel. And it was an amazing period of time of Christian growth. It's one of the reasons why you and I enjoy the privileges we have in church today. Yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing. And, you know, I, there's a lot that we can learn from there, too. And I think too often today, we get, we focus too much on our differences and not enough on the massive amount of similarities we have as Christians. Because every Christian, if they are a Christian, they're going to agree on the core doctrines. You know, Jesus is the way to, to heaven. That's the only reconciliation to, to God, that man has fallen. And, and, you know, Jesus died on the cross for our sins and, and, and all that. Uh, and, and the other things, you know, we can talk about and debate and stuff, but it doesn't make us any less brothers or sisters in Christ because Christ is that focus. But we live in this weird time today where uh, Christians, by and large, especially online, seem like hyper-focused on the differences we have. The and, and I would consider them minor differences. You know, I would I would consider even something uh, like um, 
uh, Calvinism versus, you know, Arminianism or something. And, and again, it depends on how people want to define those terms. But in a lot of ways, I would even consider those minor in comparison to what we have in common, which is Jesus Christ. And if somebody uh, puts their faith in Jesus, you know, whatever the, 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 the fringe interpretations of that might be, we can talk about. Uh, but the, the, the actual faith in Jesus is the thing that we all share in common. And so it sounds like having this, this common root and whether we call it, you know, Calvinist or what, it's probably, and you know, the, it was actually kind of funny when you were describing the way that Calvinism was for them, you know, I'm thinking, man, when I, when I witness to somebody, I don't, you know, I, I want to present the best argument that I have for them, but I know that ultimately, like, it's going to be the Holy Spirit that has to, uh, you, know, you know, convince them of anything. I, I don't I don't have that power. I can, I can show them arguments and I can, you know, get, give them a reason for the hope that's within me and all that stuff. But ultimately, the Holy Spirit is the one that really does the heart change. And how, how uh, you know, how different is that really from how a lot of Christians think of it today? And I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's all that different. So that, that is, that is really mind blowing. That's really interesting. Um, I want to talk about the eschatology, but we're going to do that for uh, members. So, uh, for people who are viewing for free, um, I've talked about it on other episodes. Why we do this, you know, we had a whole YouTube channel deleted. Uh, we we have to have a place where we could put things that we have total control over. That's not going to be censored, and we also. So want uh, I hate using the word safe space because of just what it's become in our, our, our modern times, but I want to have a safe space for us Christians to be able to go without being ridiculed or mocked or have hatred flung on them just because they might believe something a little bit different. And no one, up, up to today, no one has bought a membership at Daily Renegade just to troll people. I don't think people are going to spend their own money to do that. So, uh, so Daily Renegade is a, a, a safe place for Christians to go hang out, you know, talk about differences. We've got people of all different kind of, you know, eschatology beliefs or different things in there, but we're all Christian and we all have uh, Christ as our center. So go get a membership at dailyrenegade.com. You'll get the rest of this episode of the Sharpening Report, plus all episodes of Sharpening Report, Peck Report. You'll get Christian Contrarian and Detox Babylon. All, you know all the shows. You'll get a ton of stuff. You'll get uh, Through the Black Uncensored. We still have those episodes up there. You'll get lots of great stuff. And it's just good, solid theology. Don't spend your money on Netflix that's going to sexually exploit children. Instead, spend your money over at Daily Renegade where we'll take care of you. And I promise no one on our channel is going to sexually exploit a child just to give you entertainment. So uh, so go ahead and do that. We're going to call it good for um, – Mem- uh, for people viewing for free. Thank you so much. And uh, one last time, Jared, where can people find you online if they want to uh, get a hold of you or follow what you do? Where can they go? Through the black.com. Uh, you can also find us at uh, our channel on YouTube is through the black. I've got playlists full of series that I do that are related to Puritan work. Uh, you can find the, the spirit of revival um, I've, I've read some old Puritan sermons. Those are all there in the playlists on our YouTube channel, Through the Black. Fantastic. All right. I highly encourage everybody to do that. So we're going to call it good for people viewing for free. Members, hang on the line because we got a lot more to talk about. We're going to get into the eschatological aspects of the Puritans, and I'm excited to learn about that. So people viewing for free, thank you so much. Please, once again, consider getting a membership at dailyrenegade.com. Until next time, take care and God bless.